If you have your Bible, would you open them up to the gospel according to Matthew? We're going to continue in our verse-by-verse study of the gospel of Matthew this morning, and we will pick up right in the beginning of chapter 17. You can follow along as I read for us, starting in Matthew 17, verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah were appeared to them, to to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up, do not be afraid. And lifting their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus uh, commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered them and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things, but... I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Would you pray with me one more time, brothers and sisters? Father, we have gathered together this morning, trusting and believing that you are the one true God, None before you, none beside you, and none to come. You have created all things for your glory. And not only that, you have shown yourself to be a merciful God, a gracious God, a loving God, who has opened his arms to us to receive us, O God, if we would turn in repentance. We thank you that we can call you Father. And we thank you for your word, which is truth. We ask that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things, from your word, from your truth, and God, that you would sanctify us by your truth, for your word is truth. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, last time we were together, we looked at the last verse of chapter 16, which was uh, uh, Matthew 16, 28, and we spilled over into chapter 17 and looked at the first verse there, and we took a closer look at Jesus' final words at the end of chapter 16, where he predicted that some of his disciples would not die until they saw him coming in his kingdom. And you notice that there was a little bit of tension in that passage. We were trying to make sense of it, and we came to the understanding that that his statement was an indication that he would give some of his disciples a preview of the glory he would someday return to earth with. And we also took time to stress the vital importance of establishing your own spiritual support system and the mandate of Christian discipleship. And so I want to stop before we go any further, brothers and sisters, and I just want to ask you a question. How many of you left last Sunday after hearing those truths and took any steps towards developing your own spiritual support system? How many of you left and took steps towards uh, finding someone who would disciple you, would pour into your life? And how many of you took steps to find someone to pour into, to disciple and to lead and to guide and to teach what God has taught you about the ways of Christianity? I just want to remind you, James chapter 1, verse 22, prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. There was a challenge made. There was a truth asserted and presented to us. And and I just encourage you to, to join in this thing called Christian life together and to be moving closer to where God would have us to be. Establishing genuine, sincere, authentic relationships with people who will tell you the truth 
because they love you. They will tell you what you need to hear. And people that, you, that God puts you in their life in order for them to hear the truth of God from another believer that they might know and understand the way in which they should walk. And now, brothers and sisters, we're going to continue uh, to look at this passage a little bit more closely. And I'm really excited about uh, what we see here, primarily because this is probably the, the one episode of all the episodes in the gospel where if I had to choose which one to, to be privy to, which one to like be, be taken back in time, this would be it right here. I'd, I'd want to see this moment where Jesus takes his disciples up on the mountain and he is transfigured before them. There was something amazing about this event that tells us and teaches us and reveals to us who Jesus of Nazareth is. So look with me again at verse 1 of chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. So he has his inner circle, uh, John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So Jesus takes a select few, and he takes them with him up on a mountain. And when they get up on this mountain, verse 2 tells us that he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. So when it says that he was transfigured, it literally means that his appearance changed. He was transformed right before their eyes. He became a beacon of light, and it was radiant, and it was glorious, it was majestic, and it was strong. Look at the language that describes this, this transfiguration, this, this revealing of Jesus's glorious state and his nature. It says that his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Now, brothers and sisters, in order to understand the significance of what is happening here, I want to give you some context, all right? So Moses, the, the, the one who mediated the Old Testament covenant, okay? Moses predicted in the book of Deuteronomy that there would be one that God would raise up like him, that would replace him, that would be a greater version of him. If you look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, we see the uh, prophetic mention and, and the foretelling of one who was to come. Moses writes in the, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. So G, uh, uh, Moses is saying, hey, after I'm gone, God will raise up someone who will be like me. Someone who will have a lot of similarities to me. Now, this is very important, brothers and sisters, and let me tell you why. Because throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we see a theme that has emerged where Jesus becomes a new and greater Moses. This is a part of the picture that Matthew is painting of Jesus. Moses was a very significant figure because he was the mediator through whom the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was the one that the go-between between between that nation, that chosen group of people, and God. It was the Mosaic covenant that they entered into a relationship with God, the creator of the universe, through the man Moses. And Matthew here paints Jesus as a new Moses, a greater Moses. Let me give you a few examples of how Matthew has done that. All right, so first off, we understand that Moses is the author of the Torah. Moses is the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, when Matthew writes his gospel and he structures his account of Jesus's life, he actually provides Five major teaching sections. Five, like the first five books. And we have already looked at some of them, the Sermon on the Mount, the, that great commissioning when Jesus sends out his disciples on their short-term missions. He, he spoke a lot and he taught them and instructed them during that time. And then we have the parables of the kingdom. Those were major teaching discourses. That was three of the five that we will look at throughout the entire gospel. So in the same way that Moses presented the five books, here Matthew paints Jesus as presenting five major teachings. So there's a parallel drawn between Moses and 
Jesus. And not only that, but Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the teachings of God. And Jesus went up and he began to teach from a mountainside and he gave that great sermon on the mount. And not only that, but when Jesus taught, he taught as one having authority. So in the same way that Moses came down and gave to the people God's word from God's perspective, Jesus does the same thing with the Sermon on the Mount. He speaks with authority as if from God himself speaking to inform God's people. So we see another similarity between the two. And also Moses, who was the mediator of the old covenant, we see and we will see Jesus as the mediator of the new covenant, the new relationship between God and men. Now, this brings us to this important part. As we see this description of Jesus being transfigured before his, uh, his disciples here, the description says that his face shone like the sun. And immediately that makes me think back. It echoes back to a significant account in the life of of Moses. Come with me to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. In the book of Exodus, after they are miraculously uh, rescued from slavery by the hand of God through the leading of Moses, Moses goes up on the top of the mountain by himself at Mount Sinai to receive the instructions from God. He receives the, the instructions from God. He comes down from the mountain to find the people doing what in Exodus chapter 32? Worshiping a golden calf, idol worship. They are cheating on God on the honeymoon. They didn't waste any time having entered into a covenant and then breaking the covenant. And so there Moses gets angry and what does he do? He smashes the tablets the word on the ground, right? And so God responds and the, the Levites kill a bunch of the people who are worshiping uh, this golden calf, this false God. And then God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 33 that he is going to continue to be their God and honor his aspect of the covenant, but he's not gonna go with them. He's gonna send an angel to go before them. And Moses, Moses says, no, Lord, if, if you don't go, we don't want to go. If your presence stays, we don't want to go. And if your presence goes, then we don't want to stay. And then God forgives and uh, through that mediation of Moses' intercession, but then Moses has to go back up the mountain. He has to go back up the mountain in order to receive new commands again. Now, in chapter 34 of Exodus, if you look with me at uh, verse 29, Moses is up on the mountain and God is speaking to him again. Now, listen closely to this account. Exodus chapter 34, verse 29, it says, And it came about when Moses was coming down from, the mountain, uh, from Mount Sinai. So he again goes up to receive the, uh, the commands of God. And he's coming down now from the mountain a second time. And it says, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands, and he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So Moses being in God's presence caused his skin to radiate and to shine. And he wasn't even aware of it. The text goes on and says, And when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. He put a veil over his face. His face was shining so much that it scared them, and he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had, um, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses and the skin of Moses shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. God. So Moses 
being in the presence of God, it caused his skin to radiate and to glow. And now we have this account in Matthew 17 of Jesus telling his disciples that he would give them a preview of his glory, the coming of the kingdom in his father's glory. And Jesus' face shone like the sun, like Moses, but even greater. His garments were even as white as light, it tells us. Now, brothers and sisters, here's another parallel between Moses and Jesus. But the difference between Moses and Jesus here is, you got to get this, ready? Jesus goes up to the mountain like Moses went up to Mount Sinai, but the difference is Moses' face shone because he was in the presence of God. Jesus' face shone, but he was the source of that glory himself. He took off his veil. What was his veil? His humanity. There's a, a, a hymn, a Christmas hymn. I forget what it, which one it is, but it says, um, it says, Veiled in flesh the God-man see. Hail incarnate deity. And it's talking about the divine nature of Jesus being hidden and obscured and veiled by his human nature. And Jesus here gives his disciples a glimpse of his true nature, which is being veiled by his humanity. He peels it back in order to show them that he is the source of his own glory. He is not just like Moses. He is not just a new Moses. He is not a prophet like Moses. He is greater than Moses, who was the mediator of the old covenant. Whoa. Brothers and sisters, this reminds me of a lot that the scriptures have to say about this one we call Jesus of Nazareth. This is a very, what we call a high Christology, a very high depiction and description of who this Jesus is. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Listen to these words of the author of Hebrew. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and any in many ways, that includes Moses. God spoke through Moses, who was a prophet, in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world just take that in for a moment through whom he made the world who must Jesus be that the description of him is that it was through him that God made the world verse 3 here it is and he is the radiance of of his God's glory. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Wow. That's a description of Jesus. That he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's own divine nature. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14 Speaking of Christmas, here, listen to John's description in verse 14 of, of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word. The Word became flesh. He was something before he became flesh, before he took on human nature and dwelt among us. And listen, look at what John says here. And we saw his glory. The glory of Jesus. We saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2 when he talks about Jesus in his, uh, his humiliation, his state of humiliation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 Speaking of Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, 
did not regard equality with God something to be grasped or held on to or maintained, but he emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant. How did he empty himself of his glory? Did he stop being God? No, he obscured that glory by taking on the form of a bondservant, by becoming like what he created, being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on Jesus is God hidden in human flesh, his glory. And lest you think that we are mistaken, listen to what Jesus says to the Father in the Gospel of John chapter 17 in his high priestly prayer. He says these words, John 17, 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. Um, any of you guys ever read the Old Testament? like Exodus chapter 20, where God says of himself, the Lord your God is a jealous God. His glory he will not share with another. God doesn't share his glory. Yet listen to what Jesus says. Glorify me together with yourself. He's sharing his glory. God is sharing his glory. Who is God the Father sharing his glory with? God the Son, the second person of the triune Godhead. One God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was, before they created anything. He was glorified with the Father sharing in the same glory because he shares in the same nature of God Almighty. Jesus was in his earthly life in a state of humility, and now he is in a state of exaltation as he sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, interceding for us. And one day, when the Father gives the cue, he will stand from that seat and he will mount his white horse and he will lead the host of heaven and he will come down and do exactly what he said in Matthew 16, 27, when he will come in his father's glory with his angels and he will repay every man according to his deeds. Do you believe that? No, 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 do you believe that? I'm not asking for a verbal affirmation. Your life will bear the fruit of whether or not you believe that the son of the living God will come down and radically clean house and transform this fallen earth and restore all things for his glory. Do you believe that? Brothers and sisters, this account that we read in Matthew chapter 17, the, the picture that is being painted of Jesus, it is such a high view and a high description of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. You, you cannot read the Gospels objectively and unbiasedly and come to the conclusion that Jesus was just a good teacher, a, a moral teacher, or even a prophet, or even a miracle worker. There is something supernatural, something or extraordinary about the man, Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee, and that is because he is the son of the living God. We have to wrestle with who he is just as the disciples did. Do you remember when Jesus, uh, when he calmed the storm in Matthew chapter 8? In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 27, after Jesus told the storm to hush and to be still, then his disciples who witnessed this said to themselves, the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him. He exercises authority over all of creation. What kind of man is that? Do you remember in Matthew chapter 14 when Peter gets out of the boat and he comes to Jesus and then he begins to, to fall because his focus is off and Jesus 
saves him and they get back into the boat and it says in Matthew chapter 14 that when they got back into the boat it says that the winds ceased that immediately that 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 the winds stopped and then it says in verse 33 and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying you are certainly the son of god who is jesus brothers and sisters this is why jesus can say narrow is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. Do you know why it's narrow? Because there is only one way. It is an amazing way. And that way is what we celebrate at Christmas time. That God enters into his creation as one to become like his creation in order to suffer as they have suffered, greater than any of them will suffer, in order to redeem them to pardon them, to forgive them, to extend to them love and joy and peace and patience, that there might be reason to celebrate and have joy, that there might be some peace on earth as he takes on the weight of the, the, uh, the world and the world's sin. Brothers and sisters, you can't come to the conclusion reading uh, Matthew 17 verse 2 where Jesus is transfigured and come to the conclusion that he is just a man. He is not just a man. He is Emmanuel. He is God among us and God with us. Hallelujah. This is the one we worship. It, the story goes on, the account goes on in verse 3, and it says, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared uh, to them talking with him. Wow. So it gets even better. Jesus peels back his humanity. He uncovers the veil, and they see his deity, his divine nature, his godness. And not only that, he's got some friends with him. Moses and Elijah are right there before Peter, James, and John, and they are witnessing this conversation between these three figures. It's amazing. Now the question becomes, why Moses and Elijah of all the people? Why? Well, who is Moses? Moses is the one to whom the law was given as the mediator of the Old Testament. He was given the law, the word of God, and it was through Moses that, that God established a relationship between God and man, specifically the, the nation of Israel. He's an important figure. He's the mediator of the covenant, the relationship that God has with human beings that will be saved. And who is Elijah? Elijah is one of the prophets. Now, let me tell you about the prophets. The prophets that came after Moses, they were what we call covenant enforcers. What that means is they were God's mercy and God's means of speaking to God's people and holding them accountable. So brothers and sisters, let me tell you, sometimes the prophets get a bad rap. They get such a bad rap that they get killed. You know why? Because this is what the prophets do. You ready? They say, um, did you say that you would have no other gods beside Yahweh? Mm, did you say you wouldn't make any graven images? Did you say you wouldn't take Yahweh's name in vain? Did you say that you would observe the Sabbath? Um, I see you going against all of those things that you committed and vowed to do. You are worshiping other gods. You have other gods beside God. You exalt them above God. That's what the prophets did. All they did was say, hey, you said this. Are you doing this? It's kind of like the, the, the people who stand on stages and actually say, you guys call yourself Christians? All right, this is what the Bible says a Christian does. This is what the Bible says a Christian is. And then what happens to those people who actually say that? Oh, you're legalistic. You're a Pharisee. Oh, you're, you're judgmental. You know who got accused of those things? The prophets. The ones who came as messengers of mercy to warn the people, if you do not repent, God will destroy you. Which is exactly what he said in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. I lay before you today blessings and curses. If you obey me, 
I will bless you like no other. If you disobey me, I will curse you like no other. It's pretty vulgar. Go back and read it. And that's what the prophets do. And Elijah was just the epitome of that. Elijah spoke during the times of the kings and he tried to keep Israel accountable to their commitment, to their vow of, of the Mosaic covenant. And it was through Elijah that God did many, many miracles. And so Elijah stands as a representative of all the prophets. So why Moses and Elijah? Here's why. Because these two individuals represent the law and the prophets. The word of God that was given the covenant and those who were sent by God to keep Israel, God's chosen people, accountable to their vow of the covenant. Don't we need that in our lives? Don't we need some prophets? Don't we need some covenant enforcers? Don't we? Imagine if there were people that came around and actually said, hey, hey, you, you call yourself a Christian, right? Is this what Christians do? Not in a judgmental way, but as a means of mercy. So that I'm like, oh, you know what? I, I'm really acting in my flesh right now instead of walking by the Spirit. You know what Christians do? They, they're not perfect. What do they do? They repent. They repent. And that's what the prophets were calling Israel to. To forsake their idolatry and to turn back to the one true and living God. But it says that, that Jesus was talking with them, right? Man, what were they talking about? Matthew doesn't tell us, but you know who does tell us? Luke. Luke tells us. In Luke chapter 9, it tells us that the, what they were talking about, Jesus was discussing his departure with them or his exodus. What do we mean by his departure? What does Luke mean when he says Jesus was discussing his exodus? He was talking about his death. Jesus was talking to these two individuals, these representatives of the old covenant. He was speaking to them about his death. Why do you think he was speaking to them about his death? Here's why. Because Jesus had to suffer. He had to suffer. And that was something that most people didn't understand. They were expecting a Messiah to come who was a military force who would come and would conquer the enemies of God. But Jesus has to explain even to the saints of the Old Testament that he had to suffer before he reigned. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 10 through 12 tell us this. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiries. So even the people who were delivering the word of God, the messengers, the prophets who received prophecy and revelation from God and spoke it to the people, they would stop to study what they spoke because it wasn't their message. It was a message from God to God's people. Verse 11, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ, the spirit of Messiah, the spirit of the Savior would, was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. This is important, brothers and sisters. Look at what Peter says. The prophets were searching to know and to understand about what God predicted about the Messiah, that he would suffer. He would suffer, and then he would reign in glory. That's the part that the Jews missed. That's the part that the people were missing, and that's the part the disciples wanted to miss. The sufferings that preceded the glory. And brothers and sisters, we have already made this statement. Jesus has already made this statement in Matthew 16, 24, that you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. If you seek to save your life, if you refuse to suffer, you cannot be aligned with Jesus. You must be willing to suffer in this life in order to never suffer for eternity. 
Are you willing to do that? Jesus is explaining these things to Moses and Elijah. Here's why. Because it is through his suffering that he establishes the new covenant. We took communion last week. What did Jesus say to his disciples? This is the blood of the new covenant. A sacrifice had to be made. Somebody had to die for the wages of sin is what? Death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Somebody had to die. And so Jesus even has to inform the, the keepers of the old covenant and help them to understand what he was doing when he said he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And this is awesome, brothers and sisters. Look at what John says in, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 17. He says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Moses gave the law, and you know what the law did? It killed. The only thing the law did was tell people that they're not righteous. And all of their striving, in all of their efforts, in all of their religious devotion, they could not be what God required of them. And what it should have caused them to do was to give up. <laughs> Stop being religious. Stop counting their good deeds versus their bad deeds and start saying, God help me. God have mercy. God, if you don't do something, I will bring about my own demise. That is a person who is blessed. You know why? Blessed are the poor in spirit who are spiritually bankrupt, who have no confidence in themselves or their abilities to be clean enough to get into heaven because the requirement is to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We must abandon our notions of religious devotion and we must throw ourselves upon the mercy of God and the grace of God. And there we will see the love of God and we will see the, the purity, the holiness, the justice, and the kindness of God as he reaches down and picks us up through the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so Peter, James, and John are witnessing this, right? And who opens their mouth? Peter, right? Peter says in verse four, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So, so he doesn't know what to say because he's overwhelmed at what's going on. Mark's gospel chapter nine tells us that he didn't even know what he was saying, but he was just like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Like, uh, if you want, we'll, we'll make some, some tabernacles. We'll make some tents for you guys. I'll make one for each of you. And you guys can just have a little powwow. This is Peter's suggestion. And as Peter is ignorantly and fearfully compulsively making this suggestion. Brothers and sisters, look what happens in verse five. While he was still speaking, a bright light or a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, brothers and sisters, this language here again brings us back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 33, when Moses is begging God, God, please go with us. Don't send your angel. We want you, God. We don't want someone else to escort us. We want you to go with us. And God says, okay, Moses, I'll go with you. I'll grant you that request. And then Moses says in Exodus 33, he says, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your glory. God, I want to see you. I, I want to know you by knowing your ways, but I, I want to experience your presence, God. And you know what God says? Nope. Nope. Can't do it. Why? If you saw my face, you would die. That's why. You know how many people talk about the presence of God, right? And they have no idea what they're talking about. God said, if you saw me, you would die. You can't handle it. But God says, here's what I'll do. I'll hide you in the cleft of this rock 
and I'll let you see my backside. That's what he says. It's in the text. But something interesting happens in Exodus 34 as he does that. He says that the description here tells us in verse 5, it says of chapter 34, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him. And he called upon the name of the Lord, as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Now check this out. So Moses is engulfed by this cloud, and God speaks of himself. Now check this out. In Matthew 17, when Peter is vomiting and having diarrhea of the mouth, the cloud comes and envelops them, and God speaks, but God is not introducing and espousing himself as he did in Exodus 34 to Moses. This is what he announces. This is is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Just like at Jesus' baptism, the same words, God identifying himself with the man Jesus of Nazareth and declaring that he is God's son and that he is pleased with him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And he made him who knew no sin to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God is pleased with his son because he was perfectly obedient to God's will at every moment of every second of every day when he walked the face of this earth. Jesus is our righteousness. It is the life that Jesus lives that makes me confident, not the life that I live. But in trusting that grace of God, it changes me. It makes me want to know that God. It makes me want to walk as Jesus walked. It makes me want his spirit. It makes me want to be changed. It radically changes the way I think and feel and speak and perceive everything in this thing called life. And what does the father say? He says, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. You know who he doesn't say listen to? Moses and Elijah. Their time has gone. This is the passing of the torch from the old covenant, brothers and sisters, to the new covenant. Just as it says in John chapter 5, verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, Jesus tells the keepers of the law. Moses testified to Jesus. And if you were faithfully following Moses, it should lead you to follow Jesus. It should lead you to follow Jesus. And so here, the disciples, this exclusive group here, these privileged three witness this very thing. And what happens to them? Verse 6, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. Brothers and sisters, again, Again, just take note of people who really, really experience the presence of God. Some people think and mistake the Holy Spirit for the, the drum beat, for the snare, for the bass line rift in, in a concert. It, it might have been nostalgic. It might have been emotionally stirring, but it doesn't mean it was the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God comes, you know what it brings? Fear and conviction of sin because God is holy and that's the first thing you feel the weight of your sin like Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he said woe is me I am ruined for I have seen the presence of the Lord and I am filthy but for some reason today in our culture we have a bunch of people running around chasing the presence of God without repentance you know what it really is they want an emotional high they just want to experience something but it's 
not the Spirit of God. When you experience the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin and righteousness. The Holy Spirit that convinces you that you are free to run to the Father first convinces you that you need to hit the floor and you need to confess and you need to get rid of your junk. That you need to let it go in order to receive what God has for you. They were terrified. But look at what happens when they're terrified. Verse 7. Then Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. Who does the comforting? God. Jesus does the comforting and again says, Do not be afraid. Why? Because in their repentance, God has pardoned their sins. And perfect love cast out all fear. But there is no forgiveness for the unrepentant. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That everybody is saved no matter what they do. Is that what John 3.16 says? No. That whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. They got that glimpse of his glory. They felt the weight of what it will be like when he comes again. Brothers and sisters, are you ready to see Jesus coming in his glory and his kingdom? And what I mean by that is are you on the right side of that kingdom? When he comes, will you shrink back in fear, full of regrets, or will you embrace his coming? Will you step forward when he parts the clouds and comes down? Do you long for his coming? Do you say what John says at the end of Revelation? Come, Lord Jesus, come. I hope so. But there's a bigger question here. Jesus laid some weighty things down at the end of chapter 16 when he says, I'm going to suffer, and if you're not willing to suffer, don't call yourself a Christian. But he also comforted them. He comforted them with a glimpse of the reality that it's going to be worth it. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to have an eternal perspective to look at everything in this life knowing that it is temporary and that he is calling us into the eternal. Does that comfort you? And does it motivate you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him? One of my favorite hymns of all times, Jesus, I, my cross have taken. It's a rich hymn. Listen to the last stanza of this hymn. Hasten then from, gla- from grace to glory, armed by faith and winged by prayer. Heaven's eternal days before thee, God's own hand shall guide you there. Soon shall close the earthly mission, swift shall pass thy pilgrim's days. Hope shall change to glad fruition, faith to sight and prayer to praise. Brothers and sisters, this life is short. And thank God for the glimpse of the glory that is ours if we endure to the end. Keep fighting the good fight. It will be worth it when you see the world going left that you stay on the narrow road. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that um, though there are hard truths in it and the call is high, the cost is high of being a Christian, that you have comforted us with the reality of the glory that will eclipse any suffering that we could face in this life. God, we thank you so much for your love, for your spirit, for your word, for your comfort, for your peace, for your encouragement, Lord. I pray that we would all continue to walk this narrow road until you come or call us home. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.